In this video, we're going to take a look at the confidence interval for two independent population means. More specifically, we're going to look at the confidence interval for the difference in those two population means. Just recall the purpose of a confidence interval is to estimate a value for the parameter of the population. And in this case, we're going to look at the difference between the two population means. You may recall some of these assumptions before because we discussed them when we talked about the hypothesis test for two independent population means. And the conditions that we have to meet in order to perform this hypothesis test is number one, that we have a quantitative variable from two independent groups with population means mu1, mu2 defined in context. The second one is we use randomization to gather data from both groups. The third assumption has to do with the sample size. Our sample size is at least 30 for both groups. And if we don't meet that part of the condition, we'd have to check the population distribution to see if that's approximately normal for both groups. So it's really one or the other of these last conditions that we have to meet right there. And then you'll see that I have on here three different ways that we can go about doing the confidence interval. I highlighted the one that we're going to focus on, the unpooled confidence interval, or the unpooled T interval for the differences, which is right here. And this is kind of the fourth condition that we have right here is that sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared are unknown, and the population variances are not equal to each other. So here's the confidence interval right here. Um, here's the degrees of freedom for that confidence interval. This is a weighted degrees of freedom based on uh, the variability, uh, the variance, and then also the respective sample sizes because there's potential that those would be different. It's a little bit more complicated to calculate this by hand, so oftentimes what we do is we use a more conservative method for calculating our degrees of freedom, which is taking the minimum from the degrees of freedom for group one versus the uh, degrees of freedom for group two, whatever the minimum value is. And so we'll use that in this example since we're gonna be talking about hand calculations anyway. So interpreting the interval, we would have a statement like this. I like to use the generic statements because then it becomes more of a fill in the blank problem and makes it a little bit easier for you to understand, okay? So it would be this, we are blank confident that the population mean for, and this would represent mu one, is either more than, less than, or no different than. So we would choose one of those three statements based on the results. The population mean for group two, whatever that population mean of group two represents, is between those estimates, the lower value, lower bound, and the upper bound of those estimates. So I think now we're ready to take a look at an example to go through and see this a little bit more in detail. So the example follows one that I previously did with the hypothesis test on uh, two independent quantitative variables, but we're gonna look at it from the confidence interval standpoint. So we're studying STEM test scores in education, and we'd like to know if males uh, perform, how males perform compared to females on average. So below we have some sort of random sample right here. We have gender as our, our grouping variable, and we have test scores as our quantitative variable. And the summary statistics are given over here for those, uh, those respective genders for the test scores. So let's go through and take a look at our assumptions. So the first assumption is uh, that we have a quantitative variable for two independent groups. The quantitative variable is the test scores in this case of each of the individuals. And then the independent grouping variable is the gender, the male or the female. That's how we're going to separate them out. Mu1 is going to represent the average test score for all males, and Mu2 is going to represent the average test score for all females. The data was gathered through a stratified random sample. Again, we do that to eliminate bias and ensure the sample somewhat resembles the population. Uh, the third assumption has to do with the sample size. Our sample size is at least 30 for both groups, and the answer to that is no. Um, N1 and N2 are both well below 30, which you can see right there. So since we don't satisfy that part of it, we have to ask ourselves this question. Is the population distribution approximately normal for both groups? Since we don't have the population distribution, we have to take a look at the sample and use that to approximate the population. And we're gonna look for some characteristics in the different graphics. So we're looking for things like outliers, symmetry, and then modality of, of the distribution. Now, I've mentioned this before, but since our sample size is so small, I probably would not look at the histogram, but I, I gave that over here for example purposes only. I'd probably just look at the, the box plots right here. So neither of the box plots has outliers, um, but you can see that the females is left skewed. And then um, 
when we look over at the histograms, we can see that the histogram is unimodal for the, um, the females and then for the males over here, it could be unimodal. We've got some, some issues going on here, but we're gonna say for right now, it's good enough to go through and do the confidence interval for this, right? This might be a questionable one, whether or not we do this particular confidence interval. So the next step after we do that is we have to plug in the values for the confidence interval, figure those out and work out the problem and find the lower bound and the upper bound. So here's our confidence interval formula that we're using. This is the unpooled confidence interval right here. And we have our two means from the sample. We have our standard deviations from the sample, which we'll have to square and find our sample variances for both of the groups. We have our sample sizes. The only thing that we're missing is our confidence level multiplier. So what I did is I drew a little picture over here to help us kind of uh, break down the confidence interval and how we find that confidence level, uh, confidence level multiplier along with um, seeing how the lower bound and the upper bound relate to it. So we're doing a 95% confidence interval. So that's the area in the middle and that leaves 5% uh, left over to be shared between the two tails. So we have 0.025 in the lower tail and 0.025 in the upper tail. So our alpha over two value is gonna be this 0.025. That's gonna tell us what column we have to look up our confidence level multiplier in. And then the only other thing that we need are degrees of freedom. Like I said earlier, we're gonna use the more conservative degrees of freedom where we take the minimum of the two degrees of freedom from the respective groups. So when we do the math on this, we had a sample size of nine for group one and a sample size of seven for group two. And when we find, subtract one from both of those, we're gonna find the minimum of the values eight and six, which happens to be six. So we'll use six degrees of freedom. Now I put a little note down here. If you do this on your calculator or you're using statistical software, it's gonna use exactly 10.887 degrees of freedom. And that's from the more complicated formula that's listed above. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we find this confidence level multiplier that I have listed here. So here is our T distribution table right here. Like we said a little while ago, we had an upper tail um, alpha over two value of 0.025 right here. So we're gonna be looking in that column. So that 0.025 is giving us that value right there. And then we had six degrees of freedom. So we go down this column right here and find the row that has six degrees of freedom in it. And when we go over, we can see that our confidence level multiplier is 2.447. Now the nice thing about this, uh, this T distribution chart is at the very bottom, you'll notice it gives the confidence level that corresponds with that alpha over two value. So if you get mixed up, just go to the bottom of the table and make sure that you have the right column that you're looking in. So this is the 95% confidence interval and 0.025 for the upper tail probability. So that's where our 2.447 comes from that we're using in this uh, distribution chart right there. So that's our T at 0.025, six degrees of freedom. Now we have all the values that we need in order to calculate this confidence interval. So we're gonna plug in the means for the respective groups, the confidence level multiplier, the standard deviations, and remember we have to square those, and the sample sizes. So when we work through the problem and get it down to here, now we have it in the form of a point estimate plus or minus a margin of error. And we're gonna subtract that margin of error from the difference in the two sample means right there. And basically what this is doing is it's finding our lower bound right here by subtracting that margin of error from the difference of those two means. And then when we add that margin of error, that's finding the upper bound uh, for that confidence interval. And that's gonna align nicely with that 2.447 and negative 2.447 respectively that you see when we're on the scale of T right there. So when we do the addition and the subtraction, we end up with a lower bound of negative 9.47 and an upper bound of 14.27. Now, one thing I do wanna make sure you understand is that we're looking at the confidence interval for the differences in the two population means. So written in interval notation right here, this is really what it means. It means negative 9.47% is less than mu one minus mu two is less than 14.27%. So this is estimating the difference between those two population means. Now, once we have the interval, we should interpret the interval. So to interpret the interval, we would say something like this. Again, I'm applying the blanket statement that I showed you above. We are 95% confident that the population mean test scores for all males is no different than the population mean test score for all females by between negative 9.47% and 14.27%. Now I wanna talk about this for just a minute. 
So the reason I chose the no different than is because zero is contained within this interval. And if you think about it, if you have mu one minus mu two, if that's equal to zero, that means those two population means are the same. And this is saying that zero is a potential value within that interval. So if you have zero contained in the interval, we're gonna use the word no different than here. What if both of these numbers were negative? Maybe this was a negative 14.27 and a negative 9.47. Well, both of those values would be less than zero then. In that case, we would say the mean test score for all males is less than the population mean for test scores of all females by negative 9.47% and negative 14.27%. So those values are both lower than zero, so we're gonna choose um, the, the less than option for that. Now, if these two values were both positive right here, it would be a little bit different. We would say that um, the male's test score is greater than the female test score on average. So it really depends on what these two values are, and I kind of gave you a little bit of an insight on that. Hopefully this gives you enough in information to go through and tackle some of the problems that deal with confidence intervals on two independent populations.